Hi. All right. Welcome everyone for the session two on transient science. So the first, uh, the topic is going to be an overview of transients group activities from MWA. Uh, will be given by Ramesh Bhatt on behalf of Gemma Anderson. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. So it's uh, me again, but this time I am representing a transient uh, working group chair, Gemma Anderson. So I'm going to be basically proxy for her and uh, going to walk through the slides that uh, have been sent prepared by Gemma. So if you have any questions on organizational or other high level activities, please feel free to direct them to Gemma and her email is here. Okay, so the transient science is one of the activities that MWA uh, set out to do uh, from very early days. In fact, many of you might recall this uh, science description paper by Judd Bauman and the team, which came more or less around the same time as the Tinge et al. MWA uh, description paper. Obviously, at that point, the landscape was quite different, and uh, this uh, phase space, parameter space, or phase space of transients that is shown here sort of summarizes what the picture was in those days. And what is shown on here on the left is a, some sort of a pseudo luminosity, peak flux density multiplied by distance squared, and the X axis like a combination of a frequency and the duration of the transients. It's the combination of the parameters that nicely translates to the brightness temperature. So you can see those vertical slanted lines that are representing the different brightness temperatures. And that black solid line demarcates uh, that uh, the physical mechanism that is either coherent versus incoherent, right? So that big island there is pretty much, you know, the, the pulsars, uh, my uh, favorite class of objects. And you can also see things like crab pulsars, nano second duration, microsecond duration. So those were like the main dominant class of activities in those days. And of course, there were like quite a few others, one which was sparsely populating the right side of the space. So the idea at that point with the MWA to do like a transients on a whole range of uh, time scales, like uh, tens of seconds or starting with eight seconds, then minutes and a week kind of a time scales. And those red lines essentially show the kind of sensitivity that you can reach for different locations, like from very close by objects like a 10 parsec to all the way to extra galactic uh, distances like a gigaparsec. And if you can see, the, see those uh, dotted lines, they are like the confusion limit that the instrument is, was expected to reach, at least the theoretical values and uh, um, in uh, early on. So in terms of like the wish list, there were like a broad class of several classes of transients, like uh, hopefully detect from coronal emission from nearby stars and uh, similar objects, detect uh, emission from compact objects like uh, neutron stars or accreting systems like X-ray binaries, black holes, and uh, explosive events like uh, GRBs and uh, supernovae, and hopefully also like a uh, planetary emission or exoplanetary emission, at least from the nearby objects. And also, importantly, they discover something which you don't know, which is to discover new phenomena. That was the kind of a broad wish list um, uh, to start up with. So over the past uh, 10 years of MWA existence and uh, the transients group have engaged in a whole bunch of these topics, I probably will not go through all of them, but uh, I will be focusing more on the more recent activities and highlights. But um, as a quick overview, and there has been a, quite a lot of effort on looking for things like FRBs and fast transients in image plane. I won't cover a lot of that because Martin gave an excellent overview yesterday in his presentation. And of course, triggering, you know, taking advantage of MWA's rapid response capability, the fact that you can point the telescope anywhere within seconds, that's a big advantage with a telescope like MWA and that is being now routinely used for like a, a uh, triggers from GRBs and gravitational wave events, and uh, some of that was work was summarized in the presentation yesterday. And uh, space situational awareness, that is another area that uh, MWA has been used. Again, not astronomical transients, but interesting class of transients, and uh, you might 
Some of you at least might remember the work that Steve Prabhu and team has done. And uh, of course, image plane transient searches for whole kinds of ob objects, starting from exoplanetary emission, looking for flare stars, pulsars, and X-ray binaries, and gravitational wave events, and so on. And of course, the blind transient searches, which is turning out to be like a, quite a rewarding thing to do with the MWA. You will see in a while. And then cosmic ray detection. Cosmic ray detection, the signals expected are like a very short duration. In that sense, you know, it's a fast transient. So sometimes you will see this interesting situation. The cosmic ray gets covered in both sides, but you will see that there is some very interesting update and progress on that front as well. So perhaps the most significant highlight uh, from recent times is the discovery of this uh, new and exciting class of uh, uh, sources, the so-called long period transients. And uh, the first such discovery was reported in the Nature paper by Natasha Hurley Walker and team. So what is shown here is like a, 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 an adapted version of the period, period derivative diagram that typically pulsar people will happily show, but more like just uh, remitting to the, the crowded part of the diagram and to like a tens of twenties of seconds. That is the longest bona fide pulsar that we know. And as you can see that some of these new sources that are discovered, they seem to have like uh, at least some like constraints or some sort of uh, indicative measurements of uh, spin down rate or period derivative, which warrants like putting them on uh, these things, at least from the perspective of understanding, right? So the first source was really an exciting one, but it was uh, active only for three months with a period switch of 18 minutes. And that triggered or prompted the idea to do like uh, a galactic plane monitoring campaign and that turned out to be like a very rewarding and led to like a even more exciting source with a slightly longer periodicity. And it turns out that source has been active for like a good three decades. Of course, MWA did not exist for those three decades, but the data from like uh, other telescopes like uh, uh, GMRT and the VLA and others were all put together to show that that activity has been persisted for a long time. And all that description has been uh, reported in uh, uh, another nature paper by uh, Natasha and team in uh, last year. So obviously that's a very strong case for continuing uh, that kind of an activity and the galactic plane monitoring is uh, uh, continuing even this semester and uh, I will uh, uh, give you some updates in the coming slides. So what's happening in the galactic plane monitoring? Obviously the major goal is to find more of this, you know, that is what Stephen has been exactly asking us to do, find more of this, right? So galactic plane monitoring, the nice thing about the MWA is that uh, you can cover uh, the entire galactic plane in uh, some about uh, 10 pointings, each one of them you spend about 30 minutes and go back and revisit that every three days and uh, run that for like uh, pretty much throughout the semester and especially when the telescope in the long baseline campaign. So this is the brief uh, status and the data collection is progressing very well and uh, processing is uh, uh, more or less uh, coping up with the data rate and mostly it is done on cetonics that includes like uh, going through the data set and looking through the classifier and finding the good ones and manually inspect them. And this is all the effort that it has become like a quite significantly effi efficient and uh, with a lot of work and improvements to the detection algorithm and the filtering scheme that was put in by Janet Howard, who is a new PhD student and working with Natasha and Sammy, and also a web app that was supported in collaboration with the uh, ADAX team. And a lot of that work was uh, helped by uh, Paul Hancock, you may remember, and he was part of the Transient collaboration until uh, recent times. Sammy has put together this very nice uh, uh, diagram that sort of summarizes the duration of uh, this so-called long period transients, and that includes the sources that is discovered by MWA, and a very recent discovery reported by ASCAP, a 54 minute source, and uh, the CHIME reported quite recently a 421 second uh, repeating source. And uh, then there, as you might remember, some of you might remember, in mid-2000, there has been this interesting galactic center radio transients with a 77 minutes of periodicity, which supposed to have, you know, which apparently has like a longest duration. So the bottom line here is that you are talking about the duration, which is several seconds to several minutes. And if you remember that parameter space, it is the kind of a sparsely populated part of the 
parameter phase space that we are actually probing with uh, the new generation telescopes and techniques. And uh, that's really exciting. Okay, so with the ongoing uh, galactic plane monitoring campaign, and uh, the team has already had their very first uh, uh, light in the sense that it is all working well. And what is shown here is like an interesting uh, source coming from uh, that uh, data processing pipeline and the classification scheme. I probably won't go into the details. The kind of plots that you see here is like a kind of diagnostic plots coming from the pipeline and come filtered through like uh, this uh, yeah, detection algorithm that channel has developed. The most importantly, if you look at uh, that uh, light curves, there are like uh, some colored ones like uh, red and green. They are like uh, the known sources Light, um, light curve, and the blue one is like uh, interestingly a bona fide transient that is detected in the data. Apparently, it is a non object, but the fact that this is like a very nice validation that the whole thing is working uh, uh, nicely. And of course, the GleamX is an excellent treasure trove of uh, looking for uh, the sources of this kind. And uh, Janet, you know, whom I mentioned as a PhD student working with uh, Natasha and uh, Sammy, is uh, going through all this data and uh, applying that similar sort of a pipeline and algorithm, and has detected from uh, close to 7,000 observations, something like uh, 18,000 candidates. And uh, these are the candidates that you will have to manually expect to. Um, apply some further scrutiny. So every single blue dot that is shown here is like a, some sort of a, a candidate that is coming from the pipeline. And one of them is shown here. And of course, in this case, that is like a, a pulsar, that's a cataloged pulsar. But the interesting part is that it's a pulsar that was sort of detected as a transient when it was uh, scintillation peaked for a few seconds. And it also turns out that that is one of the pulsars which didn't have like a good position in the catalog. So efforts like this, you know, that is a byproduct is to like improve the position or the characteristics of already known sources. Um, some more interesting and, uh, and exciting highlight is uh, yet another long period radio transient. This you, time you are talking about not just the tens of minutes, maybe like a few hours, close to like a three hours. And the source that has been active for almost uh, uh, more than a decade. And this is uh, some work in, still in progress, but uh, the discovery paper has already been like uh, submitted to after letters and uh, it is there in the archive as of yesterday. Natasha has just sent me the link, so I haven't read the papers. I will be reading with uh, many of you. But the bottom line is that uh, this is a source um, that has like a quite a long periodicity. And you can also, you know, that has, has also being studied at a very high time resolution. That is the work that is currently in uh, preparation, paper in preparation by Sam McSweeney and team. And what is shown there is the kind of a familiar plot that, you know, many Pulsar people are used to, like the profile, you know, one of the worst, you know, if you want to call it as a profile, that is shown in uh, black and the red is like a linear polarization, blue is the circular polarization, and the top panel is like a position angle swing. What is really interesting to me is that if you look at the duration of the signal, which is like a 75, 76 seconds, which is probably like as compared to the longest bona fide pulsar rotation period that we know, this is quite an exciting uh, class of uh, objects. Um, so you will hear the more details uh, in the upcoming paper by Sam McSweeney, but the source is being followed up using both MWA and the Meerkat telescopes and uh, their localization information is shown in this uh, map. Um, and this nice animation, I believe that is put together by Sammy, that shows like uh, some rich information that is there in this uh, burst when you look at, uh, at a higher time resolution. So this is using the pulsar timing at a backend, pulsar timing backend PTUs at the Meerkat telescope. And this is about just about 100 microseconds of data. And the data's resolutions are about something like several microseconds. And you can see that uh, there is a very, very discernible microstructure. And you can use that to get uh, very, very precise dispersion measures, you know, hopefully quite competitive to the kind of uh, dispersion measures that we can get for pulsars, which is really interesting. And the bottom one is uh, some sort of a model fit uh, to determine, determine 
the kind of uh, binary orbit that uh, uh, seems to be, uh, this source seems to be, at least based on uh, uh, the information that is available from the current data. At the moment, the sort of an indication is like a, more like a six-year orbit and uh, with a, a projected semi-major axis of something about 60 light seconds, which will probably put in, uh, in a speculative land of something like a white dwarf, M dwarf kind of a binary orbit, but that's at least one of the leading uh, uh, interpretations. Okay, thank you. So, once you have like a two, three, four, five, it is time to build the catalog, right? Of course, ATNF Pulsar catalog has 3,000 plus sources over the 50 years. And there is a Magnetar catalog which is maintained by the McGill group, and this is at the moment, the more or less complete catalog of the non-long period transients that includes the two sources, in fact, it was discovered by the uh, uh, GleamX the GPM, and the two ASCAP sources, the time sources that I mentioned, as well as the GCRT. So you can see in some cases, you can measure the dispersion measure, some cases rotation measure, some cases both. And uh, this is something that Sammy has put together, and his expectation is that this will increase quite rapidly in the coming years. And, uh, um, that's the hope. Okay, so now uh, um, image plane um, work that is going on to detect and study uh, pulsar kind of resources. And uh, some of that work is uh, led by uh, Flora Petru, and uh, who is a PhD student working with uh, Natasha and uh, Sam. And uh, the idea here is to basically to look at uh, the image plane and the variability and uh, their potential periodicity in those light curve to look for possible binary systems, and uh, we know that a lot of like uh, millisecond pulsars are in binary systems, particularly these uh, eclipsing systems like a red back, where the companion is about the more massive than about one third of a solar mass, and they usually have like orbital periods less than one day, many of them have uh, gamma ray counterparts. So those are the kind of sources that uh, Flora has been finding, and some uh, examples are shown here. This is the data combined from both MW and the ASCAP transient survey called WAST. And uh, so it's all the information that is coming together from uh, the follow-up and uh, the uh, original investigation, and these sources are being followed up. Unfortunately, that radio pulsations have not been detected in any of them, despite quite a bit of extensive searches that is being done. That is an interesting mystery. But the fact that you can find such sources in uh, imaging searches and characterize them and try to understand them, that is like a, a, quite an interesting uh, new dimension. And I mentioned yesterday very briefly the uh, recent work by uh, Susmita, who gra is graduating, very soon graduating uh, 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 from her PhD. And uh, so this is uh, the survey of the entire galactic plane in image domain to looking for the pulsar population. And uh, so this is the kind uh, amount of num uh, the sky coverage of uh, that survey, which is about 12 uh, pointings using a uh, long baseline observations covering about roughly 6,000 square degrees of sky and processing around half a petabytes of data. The idea here has been basically to look for like some uh, well-defined characteristics that pulsars are generally, you know, expected to follow, like a steep spectrum. That's an information that you can glean, uh, extract by combining MW and the RAC survey. And uh, that gives you like a quite a significant uh, uh, selection criteria based on the spectral index. Then circular polarization, which of course quite a hard thing to do with MWA because we know that there is quite a significant leakage. But saying that, uh, you know, that uh, something above a certain conservative limit and you can come up with uh, some interesting uh, uh, cutoff there. And also looking at the variables because most pulsars, particularly the ones which are nearby, will have some significant variability on time scales of like a tens of seconds to minute. So you combine this multiple different criteria to come up with a source list. And it turns out, as you can see from this uh, nice summary plot, which is all nicely described in an upcoming paper. So there is some class of uh, pulsars that you can detect in imaging, but not in beamforming. So this is one nice thing about doing this project with the VCS data, because same data can be used to go back and beam form and double check, right? So there is a, at least about like a 16 sources that were detected in imaging, not in the beam forming, and a similar 17 or 16, which are like a relatively faint sources for which imaging sensitivity will not match. The 
the nice thing is that uh, this is probably the like a very first uh, exploration on the long baseline in the galactic plane and the disk detector like many more pulsars than that was done in the previous uh, uh, such an effort uh, using a phase one MWA. The bottom line criteria here is that uh, the takeaway message is that uh, the imaging has its own quite uh, important role to play in at least in detecting uh, or characterizing the detectable population of pulsars at uh, low frequencies. Okay, this is probably one of my favorite slides and you will see why. So this is an interesting source that was detected as an imaging transient in uh, GLIMX uh, data. And uh, that's what is shown here. That uh, if you look at that movie, you will see that every once in a while, the source comes and go. But it's a follow up using uh, the smart observations and confirm that that is actually a pulsar, a pulsar that is sporadically emitting every once in a while that will show this very bright emission. As you can see in this kind of a pulse stack and every once in a while you will see the bright ones. That is when the imaging uh, uh, analysis can pick that up. But a detailed analysis of the entire time series that uh, from the smart data showed that it is actually like a, you know, the regular pulsar, maybe like more sporadic than others, and you can get it's a period and a period derivative using timing analysis, and that's uh, the work in uh, progress. And this is an excellent uh, demonstration of uh, using uh, imaging to find a pulsar, and then you can follow it up using uh, like a smart data, which pretty much covers the entire sky. And what is shown here in this middle panel is like uh, the single pulse, full stocks, full parametric information of the bright single pulses. And according to Sammy, it is a pretty walky, but uh, I would say that these are pulsars. They are privileged to do such a complicated things. And again, what is shown here is the red, uh, the black is uh, uh, the total intensity and the red is linear, uh, blue is circular, and the position angle swings on the top. All this details will be summarized in an upcoming uh, publication. Okay, so now I'm probably getting to the, uh, sorry, I skipped the one slide, sorry about that. Okay, so this is uh, the radio sources variability, what CAT calls as like a peak spectrum sources. You know, I don't um, know a lot about radio sources, but the point here is that Gleam and GleamX, which is seven year time span, is an excellent resource to look at the variability through the variability in the spectral uh, characteristics itself. So for example, Gleam has uncovered a lot of sources with uh, either peaking or turning over in uh, the MWA band. Having that pretty large broadband, fractional bond bandwidth coverage was incredibly useful. And it turns out that when you look at the same sources using GleamX, you find something very different. So they could be like an incredibly compact AGN, the kind of sources which are, I don't know a lot, but they are very interesting, or the so-called frustrated sources. Again. I'm not sure if I can say more than that, but what my understanding is that something that is changing on a time scale of several years to give you like a, these characteristics, it could be like a, some components evolving in their synchrotron emission characteristics and so on. It's the kind of interesting things that you can do with the Gleam and GleamX in combination. And the lastly, you know, uh, an update on a cosmic ray uh, detection experiment. In the past, you know, I have given like a one slide summary of uh, here is a history of or what's going on and you know the things are happening but so uh, really pleased to give this a uh, uh, very important update and just to give you like a motivation the idea here is to basically detect uh, the cosmic ray uh, footprint using uh, uh, MWA and in combination with the particle detectors. So a group of particle detectors use like a, a standard, you know, the detection using a particle uh, showers and producing light signals and triggering a MWA and uh, basically targeting an energy range between 10 to the power 16 to 10 to the power 18 e, 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 uh, electron volt. So you can actually get a higher time resolution data and look at the signal at something like a tens of nanoseconds of resolution. And in the combination of this, you can try to deduce like the footprint and the composition and the energy budget of uh, this uh, cosmic ray uh, um, um, showers. So that's basically the idea. But what is shown here on the bottom, that is the key to this experiment. Try to look at the change in the circular polarization pattern 
as the particle is moving through and you can see that uh, the pattern changes from something like a dipolar kind of a pattern to something like a quadrupolar as the emission mechanism changes from moving dipole to something like a geosynchrotron emission mechanism. And this is a very important experiment because if I'm using MWA, if you can demonstrate the viability, that will have a quite a big impact in the SKA high energy particle group, which is seriously considering uh, this kind of a project using SKL. Okay, so there are some uh, pretty pictures, and uh, so the PISA uh, box, as they call it, and that is uh, where the detector is, and that has arrived from, uh, all the components have arrived from Manchester, and they have been field tested for electromagnetic uh, compatibility. And uh, if you are wondering, and uh, at the moment, you know that they are doing uh, some uh, uh, detector experiment where charged myons coming through the showers, and you might remember your relativity 1 or 1, 2 or 2, that producing uh, like a, <laughs> a, a optical signal which is converted into like uh, the radio signals that can be used for like uh, detecting, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, triggering uh, MWA. And of course, there is also like a work that uh, starting to process a lot of MWA nightly data for a, 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 an extensive or transient search effort. And this is a project that is led by Natasha and the team. And Dave Null has some sort of an advisory role on this. They have taken Stephen's offer to engage a master's student. And uh, the idea is to port a lot of this software to the commercial supercomputing uh, platform, Doug, and uh, start this uh, process in the coming time. OK, so my final side, going back to this uh, checklist, as you can see that, you can pretty much stick most of this uh, 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 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and uh, most interestingly, the number 5, where the hope was you will detect some extra galactic transients, but the galactic ones. But still, discovery is a discovery. It's quite an important um, um, like a success in, uh, uh, over the past 10 years. Thanks very much. I will uh, stop there and uh, take uh, any questions. And hopefully, you know, uh, I will try to answer them. Questions on room? Questions online? No questions. Thank you. That's fine because I'm not a transient person. But if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, direct to Gemma or any of these team members. They will be happy to reach out to you and uh, work with you if you have any interest in uh, these related fields. And uh, yes. So, yeah. Thank you, Frank Zoom for the presentation on. Hi, Kitka. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so I would like to invite Lucho Mayer for the second presentation on tidal disruption events, its simulations and implications for MW observations. Do you hear me well? Okay. 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 Come in. Okay. Should be okay. Now it's up. Um, I think. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. So uh, let me just introduce myself. So I am actually a computational astrophysicist, so I'm not an observer. Uh, so the talk that you will see is, uh, you know, filled with some attempts to link simulations and observations, but of course is done from the perspective of someone who is more involved in the theoretical and modeling part. Uh, this is also a new topic uh, for my group and uh, in general for the Institute uh, in Zurich, uh, the Department of Astrophysics. Uh, and it's kind of motivated by uh, the general interest in understanding the, the physics of astrophysical black holes, uh, and also the interest in finding an interesting connection between what we do in Zurich as simulation work uh, with possible uh, applications uh, uh, to uh, observations that can be done by MWA. And last but not least, I have to say that a lot of the thoughts that go into this talk were motivated by my interaction with Adele Goodwin, and when we met at the KTP program uh, in April. Uh, in Santa Barbara, and we started discussing about, you know, 
what interesting things can be done in the radio uh, when observing tidal disruption events and what is missing from the community of simulators that can be useful to understand uh, the next generation of observations in the radio and also in other wavelengths. So tidal disruption events, uh, for those of you who don't know, are essentially um, uh, events in which a star uh, is disrupted completely or partially uh, by a supermassive black hole. So a star that plunges very close to a black hole and loses uh, uh, his mass uh, on one or more orbits and gives rise to transient phenomena. They, uh, originally, the, the TDEs were discovered in the 90s as uh, uh, X-ray flares with rosat, lasting maybe uh, of order a day or so. And then uh, after that, there's been a, a very increasing uh, activity in the last 10 years uh, because it has been uh, realized that uh, these sources are actually bright not only in the X-rays, but also in many other wavelengths. And in particular, in the last 10 years, there's been uh, a lot of um, uh, new data on optical and UV counterparts of TDEs. In some cases, the TDEs are not visible in X-rays, now we know, but they're only visible in uh, UV and optical, and it's not clear why. You expect the X-rays to be the most important component because you expect this debris from the stars to accrete on the supermassive black holes and generate X-ray in the accretion phenomena, but apparently this is not always the case. And then, even more lately, uh, it has been uh, uh, found that some of them also have uh, radio counterparts, a radio counterpart that happens often at longer time scales uh, than all the other uh, types of emission. Okay, can I go? Okay, it's moving. Can I move with this one? Yes. So while the X-rays come from the accretion of the stellar debris on the black hole, the other uh, uh, types of emission, especially the optical and UV, are believed to uh, be coming from shocks that are induced as the stellar debris wraps around the black hole and doesn't immediately accrete because it has enough orbital energy uh, to sustain itself for some time, then this debris is not on one orbit, but there are uh, slightly different orbits between debris that are stripped at different times. And when they intersect, they generate shock. And in addition, uh, when they are close to pericenter, the compression due to the tidal effect of the black holes also generates a strong shock, which is called the nozzle shock. So both the nozzle shock at pericenter and the shocks between intersecting streams further away can give rise to optical and UV. This has been uh, modeled by, by many people using numerical simulations, uh, which can at least qualitatively uh, reproduce uh, the properties of these emitters in the UV and optical. Now, one important point to uh, understand is that we still have uh, a very rich phenomenology in this TDs, which we cannot really explain with a single model that uh, encompasses all the properties of uh, these events. Uh, for the optical uh, uh, TDs, some of which have also the X-ray uh, flare associated, but not all of them, uh, there's been a recent uh, compilation of uh, the available data until 2020 by Van Velsen uh, et al., uh, which shows clearly that there is a sort of uh, common uh, feature uh, in terms of shape of the light curves uh, uh, between uh, the detected TDEs. And uh, this is now what people are trying to understand from uh, modeling in numerical simulations, how to reproduce uh, the rays towards the peak and then the decay, uh, which has uh, a relatively uh, similar time scale, despite the different luminosities of the individual sources. Now, the interest in TDEs is not only because you want to explain uh, these transient events and understand the physics behind them, but also because uh, if we understand uh, the physics behind them, we can understand a lot about black holes. And it can be really a, a very powerful probe of very key aspects of black holes, which we don't know well enough. One of them is the mass of the black holes. The peak uh, luminosity for the X-ray flare is very directly connected with the mass of the black hole. Uh, in the case of the optical and UV emission, it's not really directly connected, but there is modeling uh, involved to show that there is also correlation in that case. And in addition, most of these TDEs, uh, initially all of them actually, 
uh, were discovered in galaxies with no actigalactic nuclei. So somehow they are a way uh, to render the black hole at the center of the galaxy visible when it's not an accreting black hole in normal circumstances. So they're really like a way to pinpoint a population of black holes that is much larger than the population that we know now, the population of dormant black holes. And in addition, uh, uh, the TDs can be very luminous. The models show that the TDs can be very luminous uh, around low mass black holes. So they can also be a way to pinpoint the so-called intermediate mass black holes, which are you know, still a very elusive population. We still don't know how common they are. And so this is very interesting for a lot of uh, applications also to other fields, such as uh, gravitational wave uh, uh, detection, uh, because intermediate mass black holes will be one of the main sources for the next generation of intermediate of the uh, gravitational wave detectors, such as LISA. Now, despite uh, all this interest and all this new data, there's still a lot of uncertainties. And this idea of the shocks plus the accretion kind of explaining most of the features is still uh, not really completely successful. And when it comes to uh, looking at other wavelengths, uh, the situation becomes even more uh, diverse and, and difficult uh, to put together in a simple description. And I'm talking about the, the more recent discoveries of uh, TDs that have radio counterparts. Uh, Adele Goodwin is one of the, the people who is doing uh, substantial work in, in that area. Uh, there are, I think, today uh, of order about uh, 20 sources or slightly more than 20 sources that have been observed also in the radio. Uh, and these are typically um, emitters that show uh, uh, the radio uh, counterpart only at time scales longer than the flare uh, time scale for the optical UV and X-rays. So we are talking about uh, time scales of years uh, after uh, the main flare has occurred. And, and so they have to be uh, found by just following up known sources. That's the, the obvious thing to do. Uh, but more recently, also some very prompt radio emitters have been discovered, which have um, a radio counterpart almost coincident with the optical uh, peak luminosity. So there is a, a huge diversity, and this really uh, makes it very difficult for theorists to uh, make sense of, of all of this, but also needs uh, more data uh, to become uh, more clear. Uh, how the, the radio is produced, especially the most sources are actually uh, relatively low luminosity, and they are believed to be uh, non relativistic, so they're probably the result of um, uh, outflows produced uh, from uh, this debris disk, uh, maybe due to the effect of uh, acceleration by, uh, by the black hole. These outflows are essentially broad jets or, or outflows produced by uh, interaction between uh, streams that then uh, move out uh, of the main uh, debris disk and interact with the interstellar medium and therefore. Uh, the synchrotron radiation that is observed in the radio might be produced at the interface between the outflow and the surrounding ISN, which explains why it's a lower energy than the emission that comes really close uh, to the debris and the black hole. Uh, now, uh, again, this is all uh, to be proven, uh, so it's not uh, at all shown that this is the correct model, but what is clear from the data is that there are some features uh, that make it very interesting also for uh, following up with NWA, and one of them is that most of these radio counterparts of TDEs show a progressive shift of the synchrotron spectrum to longer and longer wavelengths with time, and time scales longer than a year or so. And in fact, uh, there has been uh, a detection uh, with NWA in, in the GLIM survey uh, of uh, one of uh, these TDEs that was previously observed uh, in optical and then followed up, I think, with ATCA uh, and then also followed up uh, with NWA. So thanks to the, the uh, shift to lower frequencies with time. So many of the sources may be aimed like that, we don't know, because this is really uh, new work, uh, is really opening a new opportunity uh, to understand the physics of these uh, objects. Now, if it's true that there is a common late radio emission associated with these uh, TD flares, then in order to model it, you have a huge, huge challenge. The reason is that the current uh, simulations done with the current codes that people have available uh, have a hard time to even model just the first phase uh, well, uh, the luminosity uh, in the optical and X-rays raises to the peak, which is of order days. And here talking not about days, but we are talking about years. So if you want to really understand the evolution of the sources from beginning to end up to the, the phase of the radio emission, you need simulations that can describe uh, accurately the dynamics 
uh, and the uh, hydrodynamics of very long time scales. Uh, this becomes essentially impossible with the current codes. Uh, and just to give you an idea, the state of the art simulation that was published by the group of uh, Nick Stone uh, in Jerusalem a uh, few months ago on Nature, uh, which is done with an AMR code, with a rich code, uh, can only follow the initial 10 days of the evolution of the TD source. So from the beginning of the emission uh, uh, from uh, shocks and X-rays uh, due to accretion up to the peak in the luminosity uh, uh, in, the, in the optical. So that's about 10 days. Uh, so we are really uh, very far from being able to model uh, the radio emission at later times. But uh, you also have problems with the physics involved in the simulations, which still miss a lot of effects. Uh, they don't have a complete radiation transport uh, modeling. They, they miss the potential effect of magnetic fields and so on. And they miss also the interaction with the ISM envelope, which may be, based on the current ideas, might be crucial to explain the radio emission. However, why we come into this game is because in the last few years, we have developed uh, a new code uh, with a very large uh, team of people uh, across astrophysics and computer science. Uh, this code is called uh, the SPHX code. Uh, it's a, a smoother particle hydrodynamics code, including also a, a very efficient gravity solver, which is also part of, of the Scotch uh, consortium. And uh, this code now is finally in production mode. So we have started applying this uh, in the past uh, year to many different problems. And this is just the core team is uh, showing you how many people are actually across the different domain science uh, uh, aspects of, of the code. And because of the very strong involvement of computer scientists, we have been able to write a code that is basically native on GPUs, both for the hydrodynamical part, the SPH, and for the gravity part. This is the, the only code at the moment that has this capability of using efficiently the GPUs, both for the gravity calculation and for the hydrodynamics. And uh, the other aspect of the code, which is quite unique, is uh, the domain decomposition, which is done using a combination of global and local essential trees and uses the same structure to compute gravity. That way you, you, you solve some of the steps in the tree traversal only once because you don't have to redo it again for gravity. So that makes the code very efficient and also uh, uh, optimized uh, for both the, the AMD and the uh, NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, the applications are coming up with time, but we have included enough physics now to be able to work uh, on problems in protoplanetary disk, in galactic scales, and very soon on cosmological simulations. And uh, recently we, we got this uh, award uh, from the UHPC uh, consortium, that's the consortium that manages the LUMI supercomputer which is, as you know, one of the, the most powerful in the world, the number one in Europe, uh, to model uh, turbulence, um, ISM turbulence. And just to give you an idea, the code, uh, SPH Exa, is able to scale on the entire Lumi machine. And that's basically the capability of uh, computing at scale, meaning that your computational power uh, scales almost linearly uh, with the number of nodes that you are utilizing. And 10,000 is the, essentially the total number of nodes, GPU nodes of Lumi, and that corresponds to run uh, about a trillion particles in this demonstrator test with ISM turbulence. Uh, now, we then said, why only turbulence? Why not look at TDEs? TDEs, as I said, you know, it's, it's a good example of something extremely challenging computationally. And so this is one of the first simulations that we have been doing just in the last month. Uh, so Noah Kubli, one of the PhD students in my group, has, has uh, run that and is now running higher and higher resolution simulations. It's just going to play the movie and then I will, I will, I will stop. So this one uh, is just starting from initial conditions that were already published by um, the group of Cochrane and Nixon. Uh, so they're pretty standard in the field. We are just using this as a test to compare with existing work and see that we get uh, similar results. But what is quite impressive is that we ran this one million particle simulation in 30 minutes on one only GPU node of pin state, uh, the now the commission supercomputer at CSCS. Normally the simulation with 
typical SPH cores will take a day or more. So we are, even just on one GPU, uh, running at a pace that is already orders of magnitude better than what is normally possible with the same problem. So the goal then would be to run a much higher resolution to resolve the shock dynamics and the stream dynamics uh, better than what has been done so far, but also run much longer to get into the regime where maybe we can make predictions for uh, the radio uh, uh, late uh, uh, emission part. And I will uh, stop here. Yeah, that was a brilliant overview. Thank, thank you very much. Um, in order to produce synchrotron emission, you need a magnetic field. Um, so what, where, where's that coming from in these systems? Is it the magnetic field of the star that's being? This is what, yeah, so, yeah, that's a good question. So this is, this is one of the possibilities that is being considered. There, there is some work, uh, new work, um, that is looking at that directly with MHD simulations, which doesn't include the envelope, of course. It just wants, you know, they just want to understand if you assume that you inherit the magnetic field from the disrupting star, what will be the interaction between this legacy magnetic field and the hydrodynamics of the streams? Uh, so yes, you, 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 you have to uh, invoke that probably. Uh, in our case, what we have in mind as a first step is uh, to, to essentially look mostly at the interaction uh, between the streams and this envelope, maybe not with MHT, but just with other dynamics, assuming that somehow the magnetic field is there, essentially. Uh, because that part also has never been done. So that there's no TD simulation which includes an envelope uh, for the ISM. Yeah. So, Alan, you will be treated to the potentially linked to TD. Talk about whether this provides opportunities or challenges to the theoretical framework. I've heard about that, but I mean, I, I have to be honest, if I'm not an expert on that aspect, uh, but in general, I think the message to, to take away is that despite the fact that the original model of TDs that was developed before they were observed actually by Martin Rees, is still able to explain qualitatively most of the features of most of the sources. There are some sources that are completely uh, orthogonal to the standard model. Uh, and there are all these new data from the late emission that are also not necessarily inconsistent, but certainly they are an added piece of the puzzle that, which we need to understand. So I think it's really a field where the theoretical modeling is, is really at its infancy. Uh, and so any, any new ingredients, uh, it could also be that th these are sources that are intrinsically different between each other. The fact that they are so diverse maybe means that we cannot really explain them in a single model. And the interesting thing is that the number of transients is going to be too high, almost any other instrument to follow, particularly if there's a time delay. But the MWA, that's not true. We actually have a higher survey speed then. And so you something where you are more um, doing a survey uh, that's fairly shallow, and whether you do that on a every three nights is proven, or once a week, or once a month, or something like that, something that essentially shadowing it to catch very prompt, well lined transients, but also things that then historically could go pick up and go up. Huh, look at this, we got a transient, and this lines up with what we saw a year ago, sort of things. But the field sitting here at the moment, like that's a unique parameter space because I can't think of another radio telescope in the world that could pull that off, except for I like this source, this mm -hmm. one. I like this kind of source, let me go follow it up. Mm -hmm. a, hey, let's just cover everything and see what comes out. So that you're not much you're allowed to be surprised, like you're surprised by more time scale transients. Mm -hmm. 
DCS, um, we buffer those voltages, and then there's enough time to allow for retraction in the event of false positives from a variety of things, in which case we can purge that data, or we can proceed to collect our time resolution data. Whereas, yeah, very easy. This is great, but when we're talking about false positives here, I'm referring to the fact that if you're getting 100,000 transients at night, mm -hmm. that Right, that, I mean, you know, that, this is the scale that we're talking about. Um, that, that you're not going to be able to cover, you're not going to cover everything. You still, the, the, the name mm -hmm. of the game with Ruben is going to be, you make your selection criteria, and unfortunately, you're going to have to live with your selection criteria. Even, yeah, even with having no so, Yeah. Sorry, I have another thing to talk about. I'm going to slightly disagree with that because I actually think of the MWA. And select them all because we're not treating all rubens. You use there's a phase space. There's a there's the color information time scales and things like that to characterize Ruben. And so you can then sort of say for this class, subclass of Ruben, do I see transients? For this subclass, do I see? And so, then yeah. So, so I think that for the TDEs, you know, the expectation is that Ruby will observe about a thousand per year, you know, in, in, in optical. So that would be a thousand per year that one can follow up. That's not a bad thing. Um, so if anyone can quickly summarize it. So that the only people can. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of potential here that we need to work on to determine the best possibilities. If people are <laughs> jumping around, I think you can just say that because you're on the end because you've got the microphone. Wait, that's the microphone. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so, so, so yeah, yeah, you can move it around. It's not so, okay. Yeah, we can do it. Just to summarize it. So to very briefly summarize for those online, we've had a bit of an extensive discussion about um, how the MWA um, will match very well with transient detection from Rubin um, due to its unique field of view capabilities and some of the um, buffering capabilities. And this has started a really interesting discussion that will continue over time and early next year with uh, Rubin commissioning data starting to flow will be an excellent opportunity for us to start putting some um, practical plans into place for testing and developing our capabilities. Anything else? All right. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor. And give a one, one more round of applause to the Professor. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And next, I would like to call. Um, Steven Tingay to lead the discussion session on revisiting the distributed processing of MWA data for science around the MWA consortium. What presentation is that? So the this discussion.
Thank you. Um, yep. Shall I stand here so that online people can, um, I don't know, see me or? Yep. Cool. Uh, actually, in a, in a nice way, that last discussion is an awesome segue into the discussion that, that I would like to have next. Uh, so we've rearranged things a little bit this afternoon, uh, just because um, uh, Jordan Collier, who was scheduled to speak, was was in the end unable to make it to the meeting. Uh, so we did have an hour after lunch for this discussion, and um, probably an hour was a bit uh, too much. So uh, that's quite good. We'll have yeah, up to thirty minutes now to uh, maybe kick around a, a few ideas. Uh, so no particular structure to this, but you, you might recall on day one, I, I threw out there the, the idea that perhaps um, after a decade plus of observing and collecting an absolute mountain of data, uh, which to be honest, only a relatively small fraction has ever been uh, processed or downloaded or interrogated. And um, when you look at the, the, the mammoth amount of science and discoveries that have come out of uh, that processing uh, and the interrogation of that relatively small fraction of our, our total data, it, it sort of tells me that our archive is as valuable as what we're going to get out of the next phase of operations with a dramatically upgraded instrument. So for, for me, the, the, the balance of uh, value in the project has shifted you know, from the instrument to the instrument plus the archive. Um, the, the, the work that N Natasha and her team have done discovering uh, these long period transients, I think is a, a very interesting example of the, the, the power of the archive. And this last discussion um, is a really interesting one. So uh, thank you, Lucio, for triggering it, and thank you, Miguel, for, for, for picking up it. I think that's a, an excellent illustration of the potential that, that we have uh, for the future. Uh, and I think Ruben is a great example. Having a, a sit down and a think about constructing some future programs that generate a lot of data in conjunction with things like Ruben, very, very, very exciting. I think you're spot on. Uh, you're picking up on the unique characteristics of uh, of the instrument in that respect. Uh, that that will just simply make our archive even bigger. Um, and you continue to run into that problem of you've got the data all in one place. It's monolithic. Um, in some ways, that represents, represents a bit of a single point failure. Um, it's coupled to a particular set of computing facilities. Uh, and I'm starting to think that I'd like to release us from that situation. Um, so I have not very well formed ideas about how to release us from that situation. But in basic form, um, at the highest level, we have 60 petabytes, we have six countries, it's 10 petabytes per country. That's way too simplistic. But is there a, is there a way to think about how we could um, organize ourselves as member nations, each with access to pretty substantial data storage, data processing capabilities, um, really excellent groups of people in both astronomy and in computer science and high performance computing? Can we arrange a, a, a distribution of our value in terms of data and data processing around uh, our countries and around our uh, facilities in order to really maximise the amount of science that we get out of both phase three and, and out of the historical archive? Uh, so had, had some pretty interesting and useful discussions with uh, people from the, the MWA countries over the last few days around this particular topic have uh, been really interesting. Um, and I detect a bit of enthusiasm for some thinking of, of this nature. And the other thing that's, that, that's coming towards us as well is the, the SKA. And it's really interesting that most of our member countries 
those of us involved in the SKA, sorry, Miguel, um, starting to grab, <laughs> are you though? Um, are starting to grapple with um, the relatively near term future now where MWA scale data sets will seem trivial. Um, we've got to grapple with something a lot bigger in not too many years down the track. Um, and, and forming up around that thinking of the SKA regional centres in each of our countries, um, many of which have some substantial resources and, and need to form up some activities that take us from here and the precursors into the SKA. So some interesting uh, discussions around um, how those particular investments um, and motivations could be could be leveraged as well. So uh, last night we had the board meeting, uh, which is good. Um, and the, the, the board has asked me to put together a, a bit of a task force or a working group um, across our uh, science community uh, and across our um, member countries to to go beyond you know what I've just pretty vaguely described as uh, some sort of ambition um, and, and work towards writing something down that could potentially be uh, actionable. Um, so uh, discussion session here is a, an opportunity to sort of uh, put that out there for for you um, to get you thinking about what this might look like and uh, perhaps uh, any of you as individuals who might have a passion for for thinking about and answering these types of questions might might like to get involved. Um, so I, I put that out there and it's a discussion session, so it's not for me to talk for 30 minutes. Hopefully people in the audience are forming some thoughts and um, having some ideas about how we might do this. Um, on day one, Thomas gave a, a great talk um, and he, he loves the concept of bringing the compute to the data. And I, I think that's fantastic. I, I'm also a bit of a fan of bringing the data to the compute um, in the very early days of the MWA, in like year one or year two, our archiving system was set up to automatically mirror data to multiple locations. I think we had mirrors in the US, we had a mirror in New Zealand. Where else did we have mirrors, Greg? To, yeah, within, within Australia, we had multiple mirrors. So, so 10 years ago, we were mirroring approximately a petabyte of data. Uh, if we can't recreate that 10 years data, uh, later, there's, there's something seriously wrong with, with our systems. Um, so I think we should think about a combination of compute to data and data to compute. Greg gave a nice example of what Canada is doing with Meerkat, where you're taking the compute to the data. So that, that, that's, that's a very nice concept. Uh, so I throw it open at that point with with those thoughts um, and, and keeping in mind we'll try and put together a, a little bit of a group to kick things around a bit more formally, see if we can't come up with some uh, concept for how to do this and optimise uh, the way that we're working for um, you know, the next 10 years perhaps. And I, I've got to be honest in saying that um, a fair amount of what's gone into my thinking has been sort of inspired by uh, Switzerland joining the MWA and, and, and a real Swiss emphasis on high performance computing and large scale data processing and interesting ways to look at data that have not been part of the MWA project up to this point. Uh, so thank you to our Swiss colleagues for um, um, influencing uh, some of my thinking. I will leave it at that now, um, and I'm hoping there's a few people who are prepared, and uh, no surprises, Greg Sivakov up the front um, has some thoughts. So I'm going to hand the microphone around, actually, and, and we'll be aware of our uh, online colleagues in, in case they have anything they want to um, contribute. So could you just keep an eye on online guys? And I'll, I'll, I'll pass this around so everyone can hear. Yeah, or you can pass it around. Cool. Thank you. So 
you mentioned 60 petabytes. I think that's too small by probably a factor of three. I'll, I'll explain why. First off, best practices typically means that you have a copy of your data in two physically distinct places. Uh, and I think that's not a bad idea for data we can't reproduce. It's not, there are some times when you can't do that, but that's something to consider. The other thing is we have 60 petabytes now. We're growing. So if you put on a six year perspective, and I'm just back of the envelope here, 10 petabytes a year, we're growing to 120 petabytes by the time we are thinking about what the next evolution might be. So you're talking about 120 petabytes of data, which you have some data duplication that's on site, as, which is the way all the servers work, but you also would actually have some reproduction perhaps in something that doesn't have data duplication elsewhere. So you're probably talking a lot more than a lot more data than people think in terms of actual raw hydro hydro space. Sorry, I should end up. I both agree, but it's also been fascinating for me to watch. Um, you, you, you know, it, within the EOR, which was originally seen as one of the, you know, we have a lot of hours of data that we have taken over the time. And our data allocation after the first few years has not grown nearly as rapidly. And part of that is that you, not all data is created equal and as you process it down through different users in different cases you find this some data that you know that's just not that valuable and so i think it's one of those things where i think there's an important balance and tension if you just give everybody stuff they will fill it people are like data is like a gas it will fill whatever space you have you just yeah, uh, you don't want to, that being said, you don't want to hamstring your science, but I think there's somewhere in a balance of you need to be able to come to scientists and actually ask them to make some decisions. If you push too hard, they will make really miserable decisions that they will want to retract at some later point in the past, but it really, we don't want, there's a, fair fraction of data which has never been downloaded, uh, which has been taken and never touched. And that's not really, at some point, if after two years somebody hasn't touched it, you've got to have some rationale for is somebody really on a plan to go do that or something. So I, I, so I totally agree, but I'm not sure you just kind of go, I think it's weirdly culturally useful to have a little pressure. Uh -oh. Sorry, All right, I'll see you on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. Is that? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Super. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to chime in with a couple of uh, thoughts on this because it's close to my heart. Um, one is just a sort of anic data is that when we were looking back through the archives for the discovery of the first long period transient, um, one of the detections that I made uh, was in the side lobe of an observation that was pointing at Centaurus A. So <laughs> you might consider that to have been like low value data, but actually, you know, every detection counted because um, the source had by uh, the time we discovered it switched off. And so um, every pulse was, was precious to us. Um, so that's one sort of comment that even if we have the best intentions, we may never be able to um, fully reduce all of the data for all possible science goals. And um, it might also always be something interesting to find. Um, and the other thing I'd like to throw into the discussion is just that I think that a lot of the teams have made fantastic progress in quality assurance and quality control. Um, I think uh, Redeemer and Deb have a beautiful set of plots for the EOR. 
data, we have a lot of um, information from Gleamax. It's something that I want to capture in the, the upcoming um, DAG uh, reduction, where we'll try and get through as much of the archive as we can. And um, uh, maybe perhaps some guidance from the observatory or perhaps a, 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 a discussion, a telecon, a group. I remember in the early days, we had a lot of meetings about quality and then we just became overwhelmed with data and we sort of all stopped talking to each other. So I just wonder if, you know, if we really can say, look, this data is crap, let's mark it for deletion. We might solve a lot of uh, problems with the archive and, um, you know, keep the best data for science. Thanks. So I'm Colin McMurtry. I'm from CSCS. Uh, Thomas is not here, so I guess I can speak for him um, on this topic um, without making any commitments, of course. So we're, we've involved, obviously, in other projects that produce um, large amounts of data. And I'm new to this whole community here, but I've been listening to you for the last three three days. and. In relation to this discussion, a few things jump into my mind. So um, the point has been made already about every piece of data counts. It's very important to not throw these valuable pieces of data away. We just heard the concrete example there. Um, however, it's not clear to me how much data curation your project does. So in other projects that we've been involved in, there were whole teams of people that massaged data curated data and said basically, okay, th these pieces of data are now somehow anointed. Um, they gave them DOIs and they went into their repo. So I don't know how much of that happens in your project. I have the, um, the feeling based on the last comment that was just made that maybe some data curation would be in order. Um, that might help in the sense that you have then a repository of data that's somehow anointed as being good, and then you want to keep it somewhere, and you want to keep it in more than one geographical location. I agree with that. So then you have, have to start thinking about, well, what are the access patterns for accessing this data? So it's you give it DOIs, um, it sits somewhere. Where is that? Is that an object storage repository? Because the I, obviously um, for the types of HPC processing that you do, your workflows are not set up for object storage. I see that. I've started doing the example that Dev showed on Monday, the, and it's all based around POSIX file system access. So you have to have a way of getting the data from the POSIX uh, fr from the repository, so the, let's say the object storage repository to the POSIX file system, how do you do that? Um, can you build workflows that will actually just go directly to the object storage repo to retrieve the data and do things with it? Or do you have to have a, a preliminary step, then you, your pipelines are built around POSIX file system access, and then what are the requirements of that? Because I know that that's a major pain point for you guys. Um, and so you need, need to then think about how to optimize those pipelines so that you can make best use of the, of the data. Um, the other, the last comment that I will say is that in terms of projecting your requirements, it's been my observation that science communities massively overestimate their, their requirements on all sorts of things. One project that I was involved in 10 years ago said they needed 100 exabytes of storage and they needed 100 exaflops of compute. They didn't need any of those things. So be very careful with your projections on what your requirements are. The numbers that you guys are talking about seem reasonable, though, this five to 10 petabytes a year, I think you've got a 10-year track record of knowing that that's what it will be. For other projects that are still in the planning phase, let's say, be very careful about projections there because you can get it really wrong. Thank you.
Thanks for that. Um, yeah, look, awesome comments so far on this whole topic. Um, so many, so many things. Um, okay, where do I start? So, uh, I guess just to provide a bit of context uh, about what currently goes on. So, in terms of data curation, uh, you're spot on. So, there, there's basically not a large amount of resources put into data curation um, at the moment, and that's not due to lack of will, it's it's lack of resources. Um, so we rely on the individual science teams to report back to the operations team where there's uh, poor data quality or, or bad data. Um, unfortunately, we don't have an automated system to do that at the moment, but it is, um, you know, sort of on the, the drawing board um, to sort of make that easier. Although we obviously, we, we've said to, to Everyone in the past just like even if you just send me an email or ping me on Slack, and then I'll interrogate you for the details, um, and then take care of it. Um, we've got a very basic um, sort of data quality uh, system in the metadata at the moment, um, which could do with a lot of fleshing out. Um, and so we, when um, uh, Chris and Stefan and I are looking for low hanging fruit to remove from the archive. Um, we use a, a big mix of uh, different metrics that we have. So for example, obviously, if any data has been reported by PIs, then we, we obviously use that. But the vast majority of data is stuff that we have to identify. And we use things like, you know, the number of good tiles, and that's reported every observation by the MNC system. Um, so for example, if there's any observation that has less than 50% good tiles, it's probably crap. Um, uh, so metrics like that help. Um, so yeah, so more work in data curation is absolutely essential for managing the archive and, and um, dealing with the data volume deluge that we're going to be having as we, we get more and more receivers. Um, I just want to then, there's probably heaps more to talk about with that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, some other things I want to bring up is that um, we have a great opportunity with the fact that the SRC net projects are basically wanting to do exactly the same thing as has been described by Stephen. So I see that as a huge overlap in goals and perhaps we can attach our coattails to or attach to the coattails of SRCNet um, and collaborate on, on that sort of thing. Um, and sorry, and, and one more thing, I guess, um, to point out, or two more things to point out, I guess, is that, um, so a few years back, uh, I was in contact with uh, Mario Lassing from um, from CERN. Uh, so he, he's basically one of the main people behind the Ruscio uh, project. And so we started a little investigation with Pawsey to see if we could implement Ruscio as a way to potentially mirror the archive out to other areas. Um, for various reasons, uh, Pawsey pulled the plug early and were not very interested. And so without their support, it made it impossible to proceed with that. Um, but I feel like that's a thread that we could pick up again as well. Um, and the final thing is uh, one other piece of good news is that there is a platform called Globus um, and Globus is fully supported through the Australian research network, Arnet, and also internationally. And uh, I actually just got uh, word a couple of days ago from Pawsey that they are starting to implement it at Pawsey. So, uh, so basically Globus is a platform, you'll be able to uh, either administrators or even users can basically say, I want this bunch of data to go to this other Globus endpoint. Tell me when it's done. And it takes care of the routing and, and managing the downloads and things. So it seems to me there's, there's many ways to achieve what we're talking about here. I don't think it's really a technological issue. It's a, it's a resourcing issue and it's a will issue. Um, as well as the, you know, data curation is also that as well. So what does that start to There's prerogative. What does SRC mean? That mean? Uh, uh, no, let's not get into that. Okay. Um, just, 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 just at this particular minute. Um, it's good. It's a good discussion for later, but it's a, a it's a somewhat different discussion sort of, um. Just wanted to point, pick up on the, the concept of anointing data, which is something that we we do do. Uh, various subsets of our data are anointed as not necessarily 
understanding the ultimate level of QA for that data, for those data, but anointed as these data have high value. Uh, and those, those data are protected. Um, they do have DOIs, am I right? Um, and we can only do that when we secure additional resources to do that. Um, as, as Greg has pointed out completely rightly, many things we would love to do, um, many things that, that you've identified, Colin, and things to think about, um, definitely on, on the plate but it's just simply a matter of resourcing. A lot of our uh, budget for running the telescope just simply pays the electricity bill to run the telescope. And then the salaries of our very small, but very excellent operations team. Um, so I sort of feel like yeah, a lot of great things are identified. Um, and it would be good to think about, if possible, the distribution of some of these tasks and some of these things to do across more than just the three or four people in the MWA ops team. I, I feel like they're not going to be able to achieve the sorts of the sort of vision I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. And so maybe part of our discussion and, and uh, task force, working group, whatever you like to call it, might be to identify where resources around the collaboration could be harnessed for uh, for some mutual benefit. Uh, we haven't done that for quite some time. We used to do this in the early days, a um, bit of a volunteer workforce across the entire consortium or working happily together. We settled into a, you know, a more standard operations model for quite a number of years. I think I'd like to go back to the volunteer workforce model in, in, in some respects. Uh, Dev has had uh, the hand up for a bit, so over to Dev. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, so just I'll, I'll, I'll cover some figures, um, put that in context with a bit of a thought experiment and um, go from there. So um, obviously this, yeah, 70, 750,000 observations, 54 petabytes. Uh, each observation is, you know, roughly between 60 and 300 gigabytes of raw data per two minute observation. Um, if we really our bottleneck is going to be getting it out of pausey. So scratch is pretty good, pretty fast um, on, on when, when you measure it correctly and everything, all the stars align. So you can get like five gigabits per gigabytes per second on 24, 24 con nodes concurrently. But the bottleneck is absolutely going to be the bot, uh, the network bandwidth. Um, which is an order of magnitude slower than reading information off scratch. So if you're doing a, a test um, between uh, Pawsey and Ozstar over in the east coast of Australia, that is about 400 megabytes per second with four concurrent transfers at the same time. Um, so that means that our best case scenario is that we are only going to be able to get a handful of petabytes per year out of Pawsey, right? So that is our that is our biggest factor right now with the current network with the current infrastructure that is our limit to distributed processing is the the amount of data we can get out of policy all right there is uh there is um uh, we might have touched on this briefly but you, just to mention that you can get like a four to 16 times reduction um uh, if you do flagging pre-processing calibration and then averaging after that, but you have to do all of those things before. Um, so that can be like 0.5 to three hours per observation of pre-processing cali and calibration, depending on how it, all, how it all works and flagging and that kind of stuff. And you can do that on uh, this. We have 10 nodes on Cytonix that are, that are put aside for that purpose. Um, so do the math there, but let's, let's think about um, if, if uh, Switzerland wanted to reproduce the limit that uh, Redeem and Anarchy presented the other day, um, that involved roughly 300 hours of uh, MWA UR high observations. Um, so that's 10,000 observations ish. Um, so that's 0. 0.6 petabytes um, uh, total. Um, so that would take, yeah, maybe a couple of months to transfer the raw data out. Um, I have been thinking about if. Uh, another way of doing this is to um, plug in to if someone has a spare hundred grand, could plug in a archive server. I've thought about this. There's, you can get these archive servers in a portable 4U carrying case for about hundred grand. 
plug that into POSI, one petabyte, and fly it over. That might be a much quicker way of getting data to other countries. And 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 just uh, just to address Colin's question, it is possible to do object store with a minimal um, you know uh, development effort if we use UV fits. Not as easy with measurement sets. All right, that's me. Yep. Yeah, so I just wanted to give some insight of someone that comes from another sector, which is uh, energy physics, like I worked at CERN before. And what we have discussed about is something that the energy physics world do since 20 years currently. Like CERN is doing exactly what was discussed. So like every data produced at CERN is replicated to a set of site. Uh, the volume is currently bigger than what is talked there. Like, uh, I think now that we have like one exabyte of storage local and 300 petabytes just of raw. On every raw data is replicated at least two times. So it can be done. Like, it can be done at scale. For what is said about the network, uh, is entirely right. The network is generally the problem. Where one of the solutions is academic network of dedicated link. It's just that generally when you do your transfer, you are in very fair share usage. But, you can talk with all people from SNET, Giant, Switch, and all these uh, network providers left and right, and they can even give you a dedicated percentage of the link to do that. So you're not going to be at 400 megabytes, you're going to be at much more. But just another example, one of the tier one of CERN, so tier one means like every site that uh, have a copy of the raw data is in China, Russia, USA, and I think, yeah, I need to check, uh, maybe Canada as one. Well. So like you are over a transatlantic link, you, you can't do that. It's just like you have to get the infrastructure to do so. And uh, one of our elements I wanted to add on the data retention things, uh, what they were doing at CERN, especially in two experiments, is like every data generated is temporary and will be automatically deleted until mark as such. Meaning like when you want long-term storage, you need to flag your data that this is like a row I want to keep. Like if it's something that you generate part of your experiment, it's automatically deleted. Because if you don't do that, it just doesn't scale. Like sooner or later, you will have a lot of trash done by your PhD student that will stay on your file system forever. And this is the only way of doing it currently, in, in my experience. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. Great, great comments. And yeah, going back a decade, that, that's exactly how we did it. We worked with all the different NRENs uh, and they worked together to optimize all of the data transfer paths. And of course, what they found was that, you know, at some hop in some institution, some port in some switch was throttled to a gigabit per second for no particular reason. And they just flick a switch and uh, everything would work uh, much, much better. So don't understand why data transfer rates out of pause are so bad. I've got better network connectivity in my house. And I'm just going to assume that that's something that we can improve. We, we, it, we we must be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Miguel's been busting to say a few things. So go ahead. Predating POSI, we moved a petabyte from uh, Perth to MIT in three months. Now, it required working with the network people, but almost all the problems, there was one problem with the, in San Francisco, almost all the problem was in the building uh, once you got to a university. But the university backbone system is phenomenal, and you go, oh, a petabyte. It was too small for them to, it was free. They didn't even charge. Uh, you just called up and so, so I'm not saying that that's the, exactly the right thing. So it, but it, it is expensive in terms of people's time, but I think there are, are, are we've done it. I should shut up. Oh, no, no, there's <laughs> always got something interesting to say. Okay. Uh, we think it's a residual hand up. Is it? Yeah. Natasha's not responding. Uh, sorry, everyone. Sorry, guys. I'll put it down. Say again, Natasha. Uh, yes, correct. Sorry, I should put it down. Okay, cool. Uh, we'd scheduled 30 minutes. I didn't think we were going to use it. We've, we've run over. So 
I'm going to call it, but um, I'm greatly encouraged that there's a lot of interest and a lot of great comments, um, which tells me that yeah, if we pull together a group, I think we're going to get some great value out of it. Um, so I will proceed with that. Um, if, if anyone is keen to participate in that, I think um, let, let's make it as open and as inclusive uh, as possible. Graduate students, if you want to join in the fun, uh, feel free. Uh, it's a great topic. It's a real world problem to solve. Um, so uh, I'll put out a call uh, and all, or you can just uh, ping me and indicate your interest anytime you want. So uh, I'll wrap it up at that Venus and we'll go and have some lunch, I guess. Just a group photo before uh, lunch time. Hi everyone. If we, if I can just request you to please proceed to the garden, it's just right behind us. So I can take the group photo. Thank you.